In the life of a modern historian, there is a chance that one may come across some cases that inspire within one a sort of fervent obsession. Sometimes this is due to the gruesomeness of the acts committed or the involvement of high-profile members of society. But in other cases, the draw comes from the chiefly bizarre nature of the events themselves. This is the case when it comes to the events which occurred in the Valorian Socialist Republic beginning on the 19th of February 1911. The Valorian Socialist Republic is of course known as one of the most bizarre nations in all of Europe, with its colourful and bloody history, proud tradition of magic, and its wholly unique ecology. Certainly one could write several books on the Republic, which I have, the latest of which is titled The Nation on the Edge of Reality, A History of Valorian Cross-Dimensional Commerce, and is available now at all good booksellers. But no chapter of the nation's history is stranger than the events surrounding the theft and recovery of the Kingmaker Diamond. These events have been recounted to the best of my ability based on primary research and interviews with those who were there at the time and have been documented here as accurately and impartially as possible. To introduce our first key player, it is necessary to establish the historical context that in the February of 1886, the Kingdom of Valor, as it was then called, experienced a violent and bloody populist revolution, starting with the ransacking of Crystal City. <laughs> Up until this point, the small kingdom, located between France, Prussia and Austria-Hungary, had been ruled for centuries by the ruthless de Rosières family. They're past the gates! They can't do that! They can't do that, right? The King of Valor at the time of the revolution was a man by the name of Tycho de Rosier, son of Auguste de Rosier and Katrina Josefina, a third cousin of Emperor Ferdinand of Austria. His wife was Princess Clara of Munich, and together they had four children. None of this matters, as all would have their throats slit before the night's end, but I believe this context is important for historical texture. God damn it, how are they getting so close? The Ambrillion should have taken them out by now. Well, Your Highness, that's the thing. We checked on the Ambrillion. It's... it's... Out with it, man. We don't have time. It's broken. Broken? That thing has protected this castle for over a century. My own grandfather designed it. Valor's best engineers and artificers are on a round-the-clock maintenance schedule, and you expect me to believe it can break? We suspect it may have been sabotage. Oh! If it is, then that's on you. If we survive this night, mark my words, you're the first one getting executed tomorrow. <laughs> on a cross! Ariadne! Yes, my liege. Enter Ariadne Culver, the kingdom's grand mage and closest confidant of King Tycho de Rosier. Ariadne was a prodigy in the field of fleshcraft. Those who knew her as a child remember her having an interest in biology that was very keen and not normal. She started apprenticing with a healer at the tender age of nine, reportedly because her mother desperately wanted her to stop dissecting frogs on the kitchen table. At 12, she could shapeshift. By 14, she could control bone and blood with the flick of her wrist. She graduated from the Académie Visseurs at just 19 years old, the youngest in her class. At the time of the revolution, she was nearly 50, and by that point, she was virtually unstoppable. With her, we begin the whole sordid affair of the Kingmaker Diamond. Ariana, I don't know how they did it, but the feverites broke the arm brilliant. They must have had a man on the inside. Shall we send an emissary through the blur to call in our good neighbors? No use. We tried. The portals have closed. I'll be blunt. I don't think we have good odds. Take the Kingmaker out of the Ambrillant and run. You're the only one I trust with it. Of course. We found Ariadne and the King, boys. We got the last two. Uh, scratch that. The witch just turned into a crow and flew away. But we got the King. Hey, that's what matters. 
This was the last anyone would see of the Kingmaker for a quarter century. Witnesses on the ground level do not recall spotting Ariadne leaving the castle grounds after this, though many who were there at the time were suffering head injuries from armed confrontations with police. But we do know that the Crystal Castle was destroyed moments after she left. Now we meet the next player in our story. At that moment, Mr. and Mrs. Axel and Milena Geis of the Fabric District were at Crystal City General Hospital, welcoming a child into the world as best one could during an uprising. They had been planning a home birth, but unfortunately their home was caught in the crossfire in a fight between the police and a crew of Feverite pyromancers. The fire department had been the ones to escort the young couple to the hospital. You're almost there, Mrs. Geis. <clears throat> Dr. Russo? I'm in the middle of delivering a child here, Hellwalls. Dr. Marcus sent me in to take over. They need all hands on deck in the emergency ward. It's bedlam out on the streets tonight. Very well. Don't worry, you're in good hands. Just a couple more pushes. Can we see our baby? Is it a boy or a girl? Nurse? Nurse, let us see our baby. Congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Guys. Dr. Russo returned to the maternity ward soon after, in a panic, after supposedly seeing Helwaz, the midwife, in the halls when he thought she was delivering the child. Helwaz herself asserted that she was not on shift at the time the guy's child was born. Meanwhile, outside the hospital, the revolution was raging ever onwards, and it is here where I will introduce you to the third key player in this history. Great work on sabotaging the arm brilliant. We'd have never broken in without you. Hey, hey, hey! What did I tell you, Gottlieb? I am the best goddamn artificer you've got. Aizen Aya, 22 years old and a second generation son of Valor, was indeed the best goddamn artificer they had. He was the son of Pravin Aya, a merchant and inventor who left his ancestral home in the Madras Presidency and moved north to Europe with his pregnant wife Amala in 1863. Eisen was born in Crystal City and named for the German word meaning iron. Eisen took up arms in the revolution following the death of his parents, and though he was a decent combatant, he was mainly involved in the repair and design of weapons for the cause, as well as sabotage of the weapons of the enemy. His superiors in the Feverite militia were known to describe him as a cocky, loudmouthed pain in the ass. We did it. After so much blood spilled and so many lives lost, Crystal City is ours. They're all dead. Even Tycho the Psycho himself. What about Ariadne? Who cares about her? She's got no institutional power. We won. I care. So is she dead or not? No, but uh, come on, Eisen. It's still a victory for every man, woman, and child in Valor. I'll call it a victory when I see Ariadne Culver's head impaled on that flagpole at Augustine Bridge. Ah, whatever. We'll all have time for revenge later. For now, let's break something. Where's my wrench? Ha <laughs> ha! Perfect! Take it all, boys! We have nothing to lose but our chains! Ooh, pass me that coat. That's nice. Hey, uh, where'd that woman in the cloak come from? It looks like she's leaving the hospital now. I pity we can't see her face. Hey, beautiful! 
You wanna come loot with us? I'm busy. Oh, come on. Where do you need to be? The king just died as a free country. Come, take a gold necklace. We're all getting gold necklaces. No, thank you. Huh, <laughs> suit yourself. You're missing out on a piece of history. So are you. And with that, Ariadne disappeared into the night. To what end, nobody knew. The Feverites took control of the city, and over the next 25 years, the rest of the country would fall under their control, and the land's wealth was redistributed among the new upper class of politicians and generals. Crystal City was rebuilt as a meeting house for the new Valorian Parliament. February the 19th would go on to become a national holiday, Konig's Todestag, the day the king died. And the child born that night to Axel and Milena Guise, briefly held by Valor's last grand mage at her birth, would grow into a young woman who would spend the first 25 years of her life mistakenly believing that she was perfectly normal. This episode of Kingmaker was written and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Tutin, with executive production by Henry Galley. Our music comes courtesy of Vivek Abhishek. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Zane Schacht as the king, Addison Peacock as Ariadne, Jeremy Shawell as Gottlieb, and Takai Nazir as Eisen. With additional voices by Henry Galley, Meg Malloy Tutin, Charlie Porritt, Josh Rubino, and Matt Baker. If you're interested in supporting the show, please follow Kingmaker Pod on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram, or search for Kingmaker Podcast on Facebook and Patreon. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks.